وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد Then after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking his aid, his assistance and his forgiveness seeking refuge with Allah from the evils of our souls and from the evils of our actions and knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whomsoever he guides then there is none to misguide and whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides due to a perversion in their souls then there is none to guide save Allah and I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without any partners and I bear witness that Muhammad may the peace and blessings of Allah Jalla wa ala be upon him is his slave and his messenger then indeed the best speech is the speech of Allah the best of guidance and examples is the guidance and example of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worst of all affairs are the newly invented matters that are introduced into Islam that have no basis neither in the book or the sunnah and, that the wor- and those are the worst of all affairs meaning the, the worst of all affairs are those newly invented matters for every newly invented matter is an innovation and every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance is in the hellfire today it gives me great pleasure to be with my brothers at this markaz, markaz of sunnah here in Alperton today which is the 5th of Rabiul Awwal in the year 1444 after the hijrah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meaning that it is nearly 14 and a half centuries since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the wahiyain the two revelations of the book and the sunnah and 1400 and more years later we sit here today pondering over the book of Allah meaning that we are revising and reading and studying the book of Allah and the guidance of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it is an amazing feat that we are sitting here today but that feat is not our feat in reality it is nothing but the blessing and the bounty and the grace and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has brought us here to this point in our lives where we sit and we discuss the sunnah of Allah's messenger alayhi salatu wassalam and that we are united upon the path of the sahaba radiallahu anhum and those who came after them and those who came after them the Khairul Qurun or the best of all generations the topic that is before me today is how to live a happy life and this is actually a question that is of immense importance in the time of the early Salaf it was well known what would bring about a happy life it was something that was clear to the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after the sending of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the perfecting of this religion by the sending of revelation and the completion of it then the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and those who came after them they knew what would bring about a happy life they understood it well they knew the path of success and guidance and salvation and paradise and eternal life in bliss beginning with goodness in the grave 
and then goodness, perpetual and eternal in the hereafter. And you find quite often from the speech of Ahlul Ilm, you find that they quite often begin with this statement, like Imam Sa'di, when he talks about what it means to have a happy life. And likewise, the great scholar of our times, Sheikh Al Fawzan, Hafidhahullah Ta'ala, that they begin with the same thing. That there is no doubt that every Muslim in this life, that he wants happiness and he wants a good life. That he wants a life that is free from sorrow and grief and anxiety. And everyone seeks this, yet they differ in how it is to be attained. That's Sheikh Al Fawzan. As for Sheikh Abdul Rahman, Nasr al-Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala then likewise it's, he begins with a similar introduction that there is no doubt that happiness is sought by each and every person from every walk of life everyone seeks happiness and remember that happiness does not equal lust and pleasure happiness is richness of the soul happiness is contentment and a heart that is at ease and at comfort. Even Muslim, even non-Muslims seek that happiness. Yet defining happiness and what brings about happiness is an important question itself. In fact, it is the important question. What is it that will bring about bliss and happiness in this life and more so in the hereafter? We look at many of the people, they look for happiness, and this is predominant actually when I say some people, actually in our times it is the majority of people. that They look for happiness by the accumulation of more and more wealth and possessions, hoping that it will bring them contentment and joy. For others it is, indul it is indulging in frivolous entertainment, music, promiscuity, pornography, fulfilling their lusts and passions. And they seek that out, the second group, even the first group to a degree, but more so the second group, because it distracts them from the real issues in their life. So they pursue entertainment, so they can forget about the reality of that which they have to face. That which they will have to face when death comes to them. As for Muslims, then we are reminded by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he said, remember often the destroyer of pleasures, al maut meaning death. Remember often death. It is the destroyer of pleasures. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves, but now visit the graves. For indeed the graves will remind you of death. Something that is imminent and real. So when a person pursues entertainment, whether it be the severe, impermissible and prohibited forms of entertainment that are clearly forbidden in the Sharia, or those that may not be straightforward in terms of prohibition, but they are a distraction. Something that causes you to forget and take you away from that which is more important. Whether it be that a person engrosses himself in following sports personalities and teams. Or whether it be that which is haram, such as music and music videos. Looking at that which is naked, meaning looking at naked women and the fitna of women that distracts him. And he is happy to be distracted. Because that will keep them away from concentrating about the underlying problems in their lives. But we should know, my brothers and sisters, that these people are headed for a disastrous end. Both groups, those who waste time and they distract themselves away from that which is more important and more relevant. And they are more in need of. Then they are headed for a disaster. Those who are falling into that which is severe and prohibited 
fall into major sins and acts of disobedience that may even lead them away from doing that which is obligated upon them such as prayer and zakah and fasting and they neglect the dhikr of Allah and the recitation of the book of Allah they don't call upon Allah and they don't make dua to Allah that they are ghafilun inattentive negligent uncaring those people are headed for a severe end and a punishment and a torment in their graves and a torment in the hereafter waliyadu billah because the underlying problems in their lives do not go away by pretending that they don't exist or forgetting about them by engaging in these vices many people and many muslims go through life without purpose muslims imagine imagine that in the time of the sahaba radiyallahu anhum that a muslim would pass through life without care without purpose without knowing what he's doing a person who says la ilaha illallah and he doesn't know what his purpose is but there are muslims like this ghafilun unlearned and ignorant they have muslim names they utter the la ilaha illallah because that is what was taught to them by their parents many people and many muslims that they are live that they live a life of constant anxiety and anxiety is different to grief because grief is something that you regret that you have done or that you are sad over that which has historically happened so you grieve over it like the death of a loved one or that you have separated from one whom you loved and you cared about whereas anxiety is something that a person is anxious about for that which is to occur in the future so you find many muslims today and non muslims even more so living in constant anxiety over what will happen tomorrow or the day after in their future as to what will come or in grief over that which has passed that is a truly sad existence because they seek the worldly pleasures hoping that they will find salvation contentment comfort and happiness and this is why they chase the dunya and this is why they want to forget they want to forget about the reality of the fact that they will die and they will be resurrected and they will be questioned in their graves and then in the hereafter and as the wise poet said that as they pursue these affairs as one as a wise poet from the salaf said you seek salvation but you do not tread its path indeed ships do not sail upon dry land and that's the reality that we seek salvation and we think salvation lies in watching movies or that we are accumulating wealth that this is where happiness lies just in the accumulation of wealth and forgetting the ibadah of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in listening to music or chasing your lusts and your desires the fulfillment of shahawat and we believe that here we'll find happiness this is not salvation and salvation will never be found in that manner you want salvation but you don't tread its path this is like a person who wishes to sail upon a ship yet the ship is still upon dry land where is the ship going to take you how then is true contentment and comfort of the heart and soul achieved how do we find happiness in this life allah the most high is the creator of all things and he has not left mankind aimless without purpose and without the means to attain true contentment our lord is merciful he is ar-rahman he is the most merciful to all creation and he is ar-rahim that he is merciful in specific to the believers he did not leave us without purpose our lord created us and he knows us better than we know ourselves he knows what is good for us and for our well-being and security and he subhanahu wa ta'ala 
knows that which is bad for us and detrimental to our well-being. And he taught us all of that through revelation. This is the beauty of the one who has embraced Islam. That he has submitted himself to the will of Allah bit tawheed. And this is the meaning of Islam. Al istislamu lillahi bit tawheed. That a person submits himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon his worship, singling him out with tawheed. Wal inqiyadu lahu bit ta'a. And that he yields to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in obedience. And he abandons shirk, idolatry, paganism, polytheism. And associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Islam brings to a person. Our Lord the Most High, He informed us about that which will bring us happiness and joy. قُلْ بِفَدْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ وَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Say to them, O Prophet, in the bounty of Allah and in His mercy, the Mufassirun have said, قُلْ بِفَدْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ In the bounty of Allah and in His mercy, meaning in His revelation, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been merciful to you by sending you the revelation so that you may seek guidance, so you may know right from wrong, true from falsehood, that which is piety from that which is wickedness. وَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا Therein let them rejoice. Let them rejoice in what? In the bounty of Allah, in the mercy of Allah. Let them rejoice. هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ And that is better than the wealth that they have amassed. It is better than the wealth that you gather. And we have to recognize that as Muslims. That which Allah has given you. That which Allah has guided you to. The light of revelation is better for you than all of these things that divert you and take you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. States of contentment, tranquility and having peace of mind and happiness and doing away with anxiety and depression are goals that each and every one of us should actively seek in ways that are pleasing to our Lord. Otherwise, you're never going to attain what you want. You may outwardly fleet or flitter from pleasure to pleasure. And this is what you find from the you know, from the state of affairs in the land that we live and in the West in general. That they take a person from one form of entertainment and pleasure to the next one. You're waiting for the next game. Or you're waiting for the next major event. Or you're waiting for the next release of something. Or for the next series. Or for the next season. Or for the next movie. Or for the next cup. Or for the next, to you know, next tournament. All of your months, 12 months a year are just filled with that. Because that is how they keep you busy away from the realities of that which is going to come to you. Old age will come to you unless you are taken away before that. Your soul is taken before that. You are going to become decrepit. You are going to feel loss. People are going to die around you. Your parents, your elders, your grandparents, your family. They're going to die. And you will die. And by pursuing these frivolous forms of entertainment, whether it be just sitting in front of your phone and just flicking through social media, what's next on Twitter, what's next on Facebook, what's next on YouTube. You know, just fleeting through these affairs and flicking through them. That does not change the reality of your life. That one day you're going to have to face the fact that your soul will be dragged out of your body. That you'll be lying in your grave alone without any person next to you. And Munkar and Nakir will come to you, black and blue angels. They'll be stern and harsh with you. 
and they will sit you up and they will question you man rabbuk ma dinuk man nabiyuk who is your lord what is your religion and who is your prophet who was that man that was sent amongst you these are realities of the grave the crushing of the grave that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that each and every one of us will have to pass through the squeezing of the grave the more severe the squeeze and the crush the greater your sin was in this world how are you going to answer those questions when you spent your life frivolously in trivial matters in affairs that were not important that you left that which was more important for that which was unimportant you did not care about your parents you did not care about your neighbors you did not care about your wife and your children You did not care about your own cultivation never mind the cultivation of your family. So happiness, contentment, comfort of the heart. These are all things that we should seek in a way that is pleasing to our Lord. And attaining these goals will lead to our happiness and to a good life. And reaching them meaning reaching these goals of happiness contentment serenity tranquility of the soul and of the heart then it is built upon three main affairs the first and foremost is religion and this entails knowing the lord of the worlds the lord of all creation and what he wants for us and what he wants from us What does he want for us? Ease. He wants for us ease. And Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us success. And he wants from us ibadah. So he wants for us what? Ease. Ease in this life, ease in the next life. And that ease and that success is achieved by the worship of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala, ifradullah bil ibadah. to single out Allah alone with ibadah so Allah wants from us worship and he wants from us obedience secondly it is built upon the disposition of a person and that refers to one's attitude one's character one's positivity one's thoughts concerning his lord does he have good thoughts concerning Allah does he have husnul dhan billah or does he have bad thoughts concerning allah abu huraira abu huraira radiyallahu anhu narrated that allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that allah says that, I'm, that i am as my slave thinks i am so this is hadith qudsi meaning that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is narrating from his lord other than the Quran so it is the words of Allah hadith qudsi is considered as the words of Allah that are other than the Quran so he said that i am as my slave thinks i am and i am with him when he mentions me if he makes mention of me to himself i make mention of him to myself and if he makes mention of me meaning that he remembers me fa in zakarani fi nafsihi zakartuhu fi nafsi so if he makes mention of me meaning he makes zikr of me to himself then i will make mention of him to myself and if he makes mention of me meaning he makes zikr of me in a gathering then i will make mention of him in a gathering better than his gathering and if he draws near to me by a hand span length then i will draw near him draw near to him a four a four arms length meaning a cubit length and if he comes to me walking i will go to him running or racing so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this narration is reported by ibn umajah in his sunan sheikh al albani declared the narration to be sahih so this is about one's character one's attitude 
How is he towards his Lord? What does he think of his Lord? The first affair is the religion. The religion, what Allah wants for you and what Allah wants from you. And this is of course established in revelation. Secondly, what is your disposition? The way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will look for good omens in things. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was never downcast or pessimistic. He was always an optimist. Always looking for that which is best. Always looking at things and thinking the best that this is the way that we can achieve better. And this reminds me of a narration of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was asked by one of his wives that was there a day worse than the day of Uhud? Because at the battle of Uhud many of the Sahaba they died and they were killed from them. The uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib radiyallahu anhu and many others from the Sahaba. So he was asked was there an occasion worse than this occasion? So he said, yes. When your people rejected me, when I gave them da'wah in Mecca, that I used to go in Mecca and give them da'wah, but they turned me away. So I went to Ta'if, hoping that the people of Ta'if would listen to me. But they rejected me. And they drove me out of Ta'if and they had the youth throw pebbles and rocks at me up until I bled into my sandals. And then an angel came to me that had never come before. The angel of the mountains sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh Muhammad, give me a word. Give me one word and I will crush them between these two mountains. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, no. For indeed they may come from the offspring of these people, from the progeny of these people, those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is after the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is driven out by them, pelted with stones up until he bled from his body into his sandals. Yet he still had hope for them, that they will come from these people, those who worship Allah. Though if he had given his word, then that city would have been crushed between its mountains. Likewise, the attitude. Because if you want to pursue happiness, then you cannot be a pessimist. A person who sees a calamity at every turn. When revelation first came to the Prophet wasallam, he came to Khadija bint Khuwaylid. Radiallahu anha. In fear. He was afraid when the revelation was first sent to him. He came to her. Saying to her, cover me, cover me. So they covered him. Until his fear had dissipated. And after that. He told her what had happened. That Jibreel had come to him. And then he said. I fear that something is happening to me. I fear that something is going to happen. So Khadija said, never by Allah. Never by Allah. Allah will never disgrace you. You keep good relations with your kith and your kin. You help the poor and the destitute. You serve your guests with generosity. And you assist the weak and the afflicted. Then Khadija said, come with me. And then he accompanied her to her cousin Waraqa ibn Nawfal. Radiallahu anhu explained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that that which, he was, that which was coming to him was revelation that was sent to the prophets who came before him. This hadith collected by Imam al-Bukhari right at the beginning of his sahih. This is the way of the believers. So that was the second affair. That one's attitude. If you want happiness, then your attitude should be positive, optimistic. 
have good thoughts concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am as my servant thinks I am. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and I am with him when he remembers me. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning his servants. So it is upon us if we want a happy life that we have good thoughts concerning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Khadija said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was justifiably afraid. She said, no, Allah will not disgrace you. By Allah, Allah will not disgrace you. Why? Because you are good. You look after the poor. You serve your guests. You aid the afflicted. This is you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah will not disgrace you. The third affair refers to practical measures that a person should take. Now that we've understood the source of happiness and that is the religion. And we've understood that we should be people who strive. We have a good attitude. We have a positive character. We are optimistic. And that is something that requires that we inculcate into our hearts and into our souls. We cultivate ourselves upon the attitude of the Prophet Sallallahu because none of us suffered like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suffered. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that those who are tried the most are the Prophets. Then those who resemble them, then those who resemble them. So the Prophets are tried. Yet the Prophet ﷺ, with all of these trials, they boycotted him, they abandoned him, they humiliated him, they lied upon him, they made false accusations against him, they tortured his companions, they killed some of them, they tried to assassinate him. This is what they did to the Prophet ﷺ. they stoned him, alayhi salatu was salam. Yet he said from their progeny, Inshallah will come a group who will worship Allah. Maybe from them there will come a people who will worship Allah. His own uncle tried to kill him and spread rumors about him, calling him a magician and a poet. His own uncle, paternal uncle. Yet Rasulullah sallallahu his own, his other uncle, so that was Abu Lahab. As for his other uncle Abu Talib, after all of these years with him, raising him, being with him, looking after him, upon his deathbed, he still didn't become a Muslim. Yet the Prophet wasallam never lost his desire to bring happiness into the lives of others through the guidance of the religion. Never lost that desire, that resolute Nature that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. Happiness requires my brothers and sisters to have that good outlook. To be positive. To be energetic. Because to have a good attitude and to be positive requires that we are energetic, that we have that get up and go. We are willing to do things. And that brings us to the third point and that is the practical measures meaning what are we supposed to do? What can we do? So the practical measures that a person should take that will lead him to attain these goals of contentment and happiness in himself. And this requires prioritizing what is important and truly relevant. And what is lesser than that. Meaning that we need to now create in our minds a list of priorities. What is most important in our lives? And it is not music. I'm sorry. Actually, I'm not sorry. It's not music. And it's not movies. And it's not the next season. Of whatever film or program or whatever the latest release is. That's not what's the most important. What's most important in your life is not which football, which football team is playing the other football team and which player they bought, as if you are going to benefit if they just paid 20 million for a player. Why do you get excited? Do you get anything? 
You don't get nothing in your deen, you get nothing in your dunya. You get nothing out of it. Yet you'll talk about it for 20 minutes, a half an hour, even hours through the night. About whether that football team should or that management or that chairman should have, brought, should have bought that player for that amount of money. Surely there was another cheaper player who's better than him as well. And you'll talk about this frivolity and trivialities till Fajr. What do you get out of it? Not even a t-shirt. Because even that, you'll have to go and buy. You get nothing. So when we do not have priorities in our life, we don't know what is important and what is not. Then how can you be content? How can you be happy? So the greatest of all priorities is to do that which pleases our Lord. And to seek avenues of nearness to Him through worship. Remember we are talking about priorities. What is most important? That is most important. Nearness to Allah. Obedience to Him. Acts of piety. Acts of generosity to others from the creation of Allah. Kindness. Showing good character to others. Such as your parents, your women folk, your wives, your children, your neighbors, to the scholars. And that in essence entails following the sunnah. And to avoid that which displeases and angers Allah from acts of disobedience and sins, such as avarice, jealousy, pride, vanity, greed, all of these things that are seen as things that we should aim for in modern times. Be greedy. Accumulate wealth before he does or before she does. Jealousy. Desire what others have. Hate on them. Pride. Vanity. Because that's the selfie culture. The selfie culture where you Sit in a coffee shop with your latest hairstyle and you take a picture. And then 24 hours you change the picture. Because now you're sitting in a park. Then the 24 hours later you, cha you change the picture again because now you're kicking a football. Then you change the picture again. Because you're eating something. It's all you, you, you. You with your new trainers. You with your new shirt. You new with your new t-shirt. You with your new hairstyle. It's all about you, you, you. Vanity. And you thinking that is happiness. You think that is happiness, but that's not happiness. That's, just, that's deep rooted insecurity. Because you're not comfortable. You need validation from others. You need others to tell you, wow, that's a really nice profile you've got. Wow, you look good. Up until someone tells you you look miserable and you're empty and you haven't got the latest trainers and actually that shirt looks ridiculous. Then you get depressed because validation lies in what others think of you, not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge you with. Not what the people of righteousness and piety and ahlul ilm and Ahlul Taqwa think of you. Because they will judge you upon your deeds, upon your character. And Allah will judge you upon your piety and upon your righteous actions and upon your heart. But you want validation and respect based upon how you look. This is the danger of the society that we live in because we are, we are sleepwalking through this, not even realizing that this is the reality of the societies that we live in today. And no society is immune from these designer phones and from these iPhones and Android phones. No society is immune from it. Not Islamic societies and not non-Muslim societies, except in non-Muslim societies. It is deep-rooted 
because it is cultivated into the youth and into the children right from an early age. Love yourself and forget everybody else. So those evil traits, disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because rebelliousness is seen as something that is good in modern society. Rebel against tradition. Rebel against your fitrah. Rebel against that which was seen historically to be good. So what was historically good? Husband and wife. The family unit. It was seen as something good. That you save your chastity up until you get married. This was something good in most societies, Christian, Muslim, Judaic, Judaism. In all of these traditional societies, this was seen as something good because they understood the value of the family and the strength of the family unit and its role in strengthening communities and societies and nations. Nations were built on the back of families that were strong. Now you are taught to rebel against that. So most children that are born in the United States today are born out of wedlock. Out of wedlock. Meaning that mom and dad aren't married. Children are raised by grandmothers or single mothers or they are raised in foster homes. That's why there is a proliferation today in foster care that was unheard of historically. Why? Because as the family unit breaks down, children are unwanted. They are abandoned by parents either deliberately because they don't want them or because they are forced to abandon them because they just don't know what to do. There's no man. There's no father figure. There's no mentor. There's no disciplinarian. There's no one to raise these children. It's no wonder that these societies are living in misery. It is no wonder that many of, the, many of these people are miserable. We're not talking about blame and allocation of blame. Not at the moment. We're just talking about reality. That's what reality is. So they think the solution is more of the same. More promiscuity. In fact, why don't you try the other sex? Homosexuality. Maybe there'll be some pleasure in that for you. Because when the means and the forms and the various types of entertainment run out, then perversion kicks in. Things that go against the very nature of humanity and the animal kingdom for that matter. The very nature of creation is opposed and contradicted because now they want something more because they, because they think that in this dunya, that if they pursue entertainment and pleasures and lust, that eventually it's going to run out in, in the remit or in the, in the boundaries that are surrounded you, that, that are surrounding you, that there's not enough in there for you. Because it's all about dunya, there's no spirituality left. So then they try to break beyond the boundaries. So then they enter into these despicable, perverted, unnatural behaviors such as desiring to be the opposite sex. So they think they're going to find happiness. But then when you look at the statistics, actually the suicide rate and the self-harming rate in the transgender community is much higher than normal society. So you didn't find happiness. You thought you were a woman trapped inside a man's body so they had a sex change, surgical procedures done on their body, hormonal treatment. Estrogen being pumped into their body. Testosterone suppressants. And they think that this is going to be happy because now he is what he always thought he was, a woman. But actually he's not a woman. And he doesn't find happiness in that. Because that's not where happiness lies. He gets more depressed. And then they say, oh, it's because society doesn't accept me. Well, if that was the case, every Muslim will be suicidal because you don't accept us. 
But we're not suicidal, right? We want to live. And we want to live long lives with righteous deeds. We want to raise children upon piety. And if you're black and a Muslim living in the West, then it's even harder for you. Because you're religiously profiled and you're racially profiled. But still you want to live. Suicide is almost unheard of in practicing Muslim communities. Almost unheard of. Unless there's some sort of mental problem where they don't have control over their faculties due to insanity. But in general, Muslims don't commit suicide. Practicing Muslims especially. So you'd think the poorer you are, the more deprived you are. That you are an underclass, you are second class. You don't have nationality, maybe you're a refugee. Maybe you're seeking asylum. Your mother, your father, your brothers and sisters were killed in your home country. And somehow you found your way to the West for whatever reason. Yet you want to live. You don't want to die. But those people who cross the boundaries of nature into behaviors that are unnatural, go against their innate creation with which they were created. It is no wonder that they feel suicidal, they feel depressed and they feel down and they are always in the pursuit of happiness but they're looking in the wrong direction. They're looking completely in the wrong direction because they're not going to find happiness in that. And the more that they teach the children this, the more sadness will be spread in society. The more that you take a person away from his fitra, away from his innate nature, into habits and behaviors that are contradictory and, 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 and oppose that which he was born with and that which his nature calls him to, then that's going to lead to misery and more and more misery. Like having multiple partners for a woman because now they're taught you can have many, many partners. Sleep around every night. Is she a happy woman? She's never happy. That woman will never be happy, a promiscuous woman. Because promiscuity is not natural to women. Women are innately monogamous. One partner. If he dies or she divorces, then she will marry another and be monogamous with him. That's the nature of woman. That's why women by nature are very selective. Men are less so. And you know, as men, men are, men are less selective. That's why promiscuity is more rampant in men than it ever has been in history in women. Throughout history, men are capable of having multiple partners. They are capable of sleeping around. Yes, they are capable of that. Much more capable of that than women because men are not selective or they're, or they're less selective than women at the least whereas women are very careful they want the right man they want him to be strong that's the nature of women one who is caring one who is, who is a protector a provider that's the nature of women you take them out of that and you tell them no actually you can be just like a man you're a feminist okay but you want to be a man or you want to behave like a man how does that make you you know how does that make you a better woman because all you're doing is just doing what men do rather you should be feminine not a feminist so the reality is my brothers and sisters that this affair where you see western society is falling apart they're falling apart because they're leaving the traditional values even if they were values of Ahlul Kitab because they are remnants of that which was revealed to Musa and Isa in their books and some of those traditions remain but the more that they distance themselves from those traditions the more their societies fell apart and the more that the Muslims move away from the traditions of Islam and it is the true religion and it is the religion that abrogates all the other religions that came before it it is the only religion of Tawheed that remains upon the earth today. That recognizes that there is one Lord and Creator who has the sole right to be worshipped. Islam is the only religion that calls to that today. 
So as if Muslims distance themselves from those values of Islam and those traditions of Islam, meaning the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ and his sunnah, then those Muslim communities, those Muslim families, those Muslim societies, what happened to the Christians and the Jews in their societies will come upon the Muslims, just like the Prophet ﷺ said that you will follow those who came before, before you, cubic length by cubic length, hand span by hand span, up until if one of them was to crawl into the hole of a lizard, one of you would do likewise. They said, Ya Rasulullah, do you mean the Jews and the Christians? He said, who else? You will follow the ways of those who came before you. Wal-iyadu billah. That you should do that in your very innate nature that you should do that. Meaning that you're born as one species or one jinns. Meaning one sex and one gender. And then you decide, actually, I don't want to be that species or that gender. So I want to redefine myself. So they say that they are re-identifying themselves. They identify, a man will identify himself as a woman because they say that gender is a social construct. So they invent these terms, trying to confuse the people. No, no, Akhi, sex and gender are two separate things. Sex is what you're born with, gender is what you choose because society tells you that you're a woman. And society tells you that you're a man, but if you want to be a man, but you were born with the genitalia of a woman, then you can be a man. So it's this type of madness and insanity that is taken as the norm in these societies. How are you going to ever find happiness through that mess? It's like living in a sewer looking for fresh water. You're not going to find it. All you're going to find is polluted, filthy water mixed with the with the waste of humans and animals. But in that sewer, you're looking for fresh water. Come out the sewer. Clean yourselves, purify yourselves. And walk and breathe the fresh air. And drink the pure water. So this affair, the practical measures. Cultivating in yourself worship, obedience, wara, piety, generosity and kindness, good character, brave as a man and as a woman. That you are brave and courageous. You don't have to worry about whether you love yourself. You know, you don't have to wake up every morning and tell yourself, I love me, I love me. Like, you know, they do, th you know, when they, when they go to psychiatry, so if you look at this, woke community this is what they do wake up every morning and tell yourself 10 times that i love me you ain't got time to love anybody else you're too busy loving yourself be a man and a man means a person who follows the seerah and the biography and the life of the prophets and the messengers he reads about Ibrahim alayhi salam and Musa and Isa, Ishaq, Yaqub, Yusuf, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he emulates them. Those were men of courage. And those who followed them from their disciples, from their companions. The likes of Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman and Ali, Sa'ad and Sa'id, Talha and Zubair, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. And from amongst the women, the likes of Khadija. Look at this woman. Radiallahu anha. The mother of the believers. She said, no by Allah. Allah will not disgrace you, O Muhammad. Allah will not disgrace you, my husband. Because you are good. You serve the people, you look after them, you feed them, you are generous, you are kind. Allah will not disgrace a man like you. These are women. Women of courage. Women of piety, the likes of Aisha radiallahu anha. The likes of Um Salama, Um Sulaim, Um Habiba. These were righteous and pious women. And men, 
brave and courageous, honest and truthful, obedient, selfless, not, sh not, not selfish, not just caring about themselves, but caring about others, kind to their neighbors, good to their parents, like Asma bin Tabi Bakr, even though her mother was a mushrika and a staunch pagan, she still hosted her in her home and served her. And none of these measures are possible to achieve except for the one who has believed and submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of creation. So let us mention these steps and means that will bring and lead a person to that happiness and to the contentment of his soul, which will bring him to feel that he has attained the greatest of the treasures of the world, even if he is poor and in poverty without wealth. Because a person can be happy. He can think to himself, Allah has given me everything. Though financially he has nothing. Imagine that attitude in the times that we live in today. Someone comes to you and he says to you, what do you have? You know you don't have much. Maybe you have enough to last you till the end of the day. But you say, Allah has given me so much. Walillahi alhamd. I have nothing to complain about. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man asbaha minkum aminan fi sirbihi. Mu'afan fi jasadihi. Indahu qutu yawmihi. Ka'annama hizat lahu dunya. Whosoever from among you wakes up in the morning, secure in his home, healthy in his body, having his food for the day, then it is as if the whole of the world has been gathered for him. The hadith reported by Imam Al-Tirmidhi, authenticated. And likewise, Adab Al-Mufrad and Shaykh Al-Albani said the narration is Hassan. Look at the attitude of this believer. This noble individual who wakes up in the morning and he says to himself, Alhamdulillah, I'm secure in my bed. I'm safe. My wife is safe. My children are safe. Allah has kept them safe. He gets out of bed and he says, Alhamdulillah, I have health. Then he sees and he sees that he has enough food to last him till the evening. And he thinks to himself, it is as if Allah has gathered for me all of the treasures of this dunya. Look at the attitude of the believer who is content and joyous at the bounty of Allah, having good thoughts of Allah, knowing that inshallah tomorrow the same will happen. Allah will give me contentment and He will keep me content. And this is why, my brothers and sisters, we should consider what we call today the simple things in life. Those simple things that actually we take for granted. Yet this believer sees that the treasures of the world have been gathered for him because he is safe, he is healthy and he is fed. For him, that's the dunya. That's like an African tribesman in the deepest depths of Africa living in a mud hut, no electricity, no gas, no solar power. He has something that lights so he can see in the dark to read the book of Allah. So he can read the Quran, the Mus'haf. And he has enough stores to last him a day or two. He knows that he's healthy. He has maybe a small patch where he grows his vegetables and maybe a goat or a sheep. He looks at his children and he thanks Allah. Allah has given me these children, these offspring. This is what we call the simple things in life. Yet he is content. He says to himself, look, Allah has given me everything. What more do I want? I have a wife. I have children. I have Islam. These are the things that people take for granted. What happiness are you looking for? What is your pursuit? What are your priorities? Safe, healthy, fed. 
wife, children, mother, father, iman. The first step to achieve that, my brothers and sisters, and that is the greatest of all means that will bring happiness and tranquility into the heart and contentment. And that is by belief, by iman and righteous deeds, iman and amal salih And this is the root and the foundation of happiness. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكْرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ Whomsoever works righteous deeds, whether male or female, while he is a true believer, verily to him we will give a good life. Who does Allah give a good life to? وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ He is a believer. So Allah will give him حَيَاتٍ طَيِّبًا A good life. وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجَرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ So Allah will give them a good life. And we shall certainly give them a reward according to the best of what they used to do. Iman, male or female and righteous deeds, it doesn't matter, man or woman. Allah will give them a good life. Because the foundation of having a good life and happiness and tranquility and contentment is worshipping Allah. Having iman in Allah. Iman in that which He has revealed and He has informed you of from the matters of the seen and the unseen. Obedience to Him by performing righteous deeds. Allah has promised you a righteous, Allah has promised you a good life if you were to do that. And the reason for this good life is very clear because whomsoever believes in Allah and what He has sent down sincerely with correct and sound belief, as is found in the Quran and the Sunnah and in the Creed and the belief or the Aqeedah of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, then such belief rectifies the hearts. Does it not? Belief in Allah, belief in the angels, belief in the messengers, belief in the books and then the messengers, belief in the last day, belief in the pre-decree, it's good and it's evil. Belief in the whole of revelation, that which Allah has sent to his, to, to his Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Does that not rectify the hearts? Correct the character, because revelation corrects the character. The Prophet ﷺ said that I was not sent except to perfect the noble character. And that will make good for them. Their life in this world, their life in the grave, and their life in the hereafter. Unlike the kuffar, where they have fleeting times of happiness, they get depressed, then they get happy. They get drunk, they think they're happy, then they sober up and they get a hangover and then they realize they're actually depressed again. Whereas the believer, he's happy throughout the whole of his life. He is content with the decree of Allah, even if that decree is painful. Like the Prophet ﷺ, where he saw his son die in his own arms. Is that not painful? Khadija died before he migrated to Medina. Is that not painful? Yet he was content with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather he was pleased with the decree of Allah because he did not show any displeasure in that which Allah had decreed for him. Then happiness in the grave. Then happiness in the hereafter. We have three lives of happiness. Contentment in this life. Happiness in the grave, joy in the hereafter. This is true happiness, my brothers and sisters. One can argue as non-Muslims do, and even sinful Muslims do, negligent Muslims do, inattentive Muslims do, غافلون. 
They say that there are elements in this world not connected to belief that can bring happiness and contentment. So they make mention of wealth and children and family and good job and so on. And they focus upon that. They believe that happiness and contentment lies in that. Neglecting iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Though aspects of this is true, that people can sense a, feel a sense of happiness and well-being in these things. However, as we mentioned, it is only limited to this world. It is not deep and meaningful contentment. Because when these worldly joys are lost, and they can be lost to anyone, right? Because a person can be married one day, and his wife leaves him. He has children, and they die. His parents, they pass away. His wealth, he loses it. His job, he's lost it. Because these are things that can come and go. Because when these worldly joys are lost through death, divorce, poverty, these same people feel that their whole world has fallen apart. So they enter into depression, constant sorrow and grief. Many even desire death and they seek it out. Whereas belief in Allah, His revelation, the last day, the divine decree, the qadr of Allah and His qada guides people to all that is good. And it is not limited to this world alone. So you may look up to that footballer who, earn, who earns a hundred million a year. And you may think, that's happiness. That's not happiness. It is limited. It is restricted. You look at people of wealth and you desire what they have and you think this will bring you happiness. Or you look at people who have status. Or they are famous. And you think that will bring you happiness. Or you, look, or you see beautiful women that are presented on the billboards or on adverts. And you think that will bring me happiness. But these are fleeting. They come and they go. But the happiness that remains is the happiness that remains in the three abodes. The abode of this life and the abode of the grave and the abode of the hereafter. And that is given to only one person. And that is the believer, male or female. And that's why when it is lost, when the believer experiences death in the family, he says, Qaddar Allah wa ma sha fa'al. It is but the decree of Allah. And whatever Allah wills, He does. That's the way of the believer. He is content with the decree of Allah. Whereas the kafir, or the one weak in iman, when something happens, he loses his job, he loses his house, he loses his wife, he thinks the whole world has collapsed, there is nothing for him to live for. Was that the attitude of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? His wife Khadija died. His uncle Abu Talib who used to protect him died. He was boycotted and left into the, in the valley of, of Mecca. He was stoned, abandoned, warned against. Yet the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he never lost hope. He never said once that my world has fallen apart as you find the people today saying. Why? Because if you put all of your reliance upon what you can get from happiness and the fleeting pleasures of this world, when those fleeting pleasures disappear, your life falls apart because you have nothing else to lean upon. Because you never set your priorities correctly. You never set it correctly, Barakallahu Feekum. So my brothers and sisters, though it is true that people can feel a sense of happiness and well-being in these things, but it is not deep and meaningful. Because these worldly joys and pleasures are lost through death and divorce and poverty. These same people feel their whole world has fallen apart. Whereas belief in Allah and the last day and in revelation then it is something that a person holds up until he dies and then it will protect him 
in his grave and in the hereafter. He teaches them how to deal with happiness and joy, to seek the blessings and the bounties of Allah. So they are constantly grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in praise of him through worship and dhikr. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله Car Park announcement Two vehicles to return uh, Two drivers to return to the vehicles immediately HG06USS and KU70PFX HG06 USS KU70PFX please return to your car immediately so belief in Allah and that which he has revealed in his book and upon the tongue of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his tacit approvals and his character and his manners as Aisha radiallahu anha said when she was asked about the character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam she said his character was the Qur'an when a person has this deeply rooted in his soul and in his nafs, in his heart it teaches him how to deal with happiness and joy how to seek it, how to seek the blessings and the bounties of Allah. So a person is constantly grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in praise of him. This in turn allows him likewise to cope in times of trial and tribulation, in loss and in affliction. That loss and affliction that can bring about qaliq or anxiety and ham, sorrow, and huzan, grief. So by embracing this iman in Allah and in following the revelation of the kitab and the sunnah, a person finds contentment, rida, when the painful decrees of Allah afflict him. So he is patient. And he knows that these are nothing but tests from Allah. They are tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is trying him to see which of you is best in deeds and to measure you to see how you will stand up when you are tried with the greatest of trials. Will you stand like the prophets and those who resemble them? Or will you fall as if you are upon an edge. If it is something in your favor, then you'll follow Islam. If it goes against you, then you will follow other 
a path other than Islam. وَالْإِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ Like the munafiqoon. Waiting to see whether you are favored. If you are favored, you remain firm upon Islam. And when you are tried, then you run from Islam and you seek solace elsewhere. So Iman and righteous deeds that build and strength Iman bring about good thoughts about Allah. If you have Iman, you will have good thoughts. Because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the believers. Whatever afflicts you is a test and a trial, yes. But I will stand and I will call upon my Lord and I will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to aid me. When I am sad and sorrowful and I'm grieving or I'm anxious about what will happen tomorrow or the day after. Just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that there is nothing more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than dua. Nothing that Allah loves more from you than that you call upon him and supplicate to him. As he said in a hadith reported by Imam al-Tirmidhi in his sunan. And my brothers and sisters, this dua that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us richness of the heart and contentment of the soul. True happiness. Al-ghina. As the Prophet sallallahu said, ghina nafs. It is not al-ghina laysa kathratul arad. Laysa al-ghina kathratul arad. As the Prophet sallallahu said, that richness it's not by having love, having many, many possessions. However, richness or true richness is richness of the soul. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should constantly ask Allah to give us that true richness, which is the richness of the heart and the soul. And that is through dua. And it is from the greatest of the acts of worship. To call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because when you call upon Allah and you ask Allah to keep you happy, happiness that is defined by contentment, satisfaction, comfort of the soul, tranquility of the heart. When you call upon Allah, you call upon Allah because you know that you have no ability and that you are reliant and dependent upon Allah and you are humble before Him and you concede to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the greatness of Allah His quwa and His qudra that He is the one who is rich He is the one who is majestic and divinely proud. He is the one who can fulfill your needs. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord said, call upon me and I will answer you. Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu used to say that I do not take it upon myself to give great importance to the answer of the dua. I do not take it upon myself to give great importance to the answer. However, I give importance to the dua. And when I give importance to the dua, then I know that the answer will come along with it. This is the way of the Sahaba. This is the way of the pious. So you're, what do we give importance to? We give importance to the supplication itself. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the supplication because we are unable and Allah is qadir. We are weak and Allah is qawi. We are da'if and Allah is qawi, strong and powerful. Allah is the one who answers. Allah is the one who is able to answer. So what do we focus upon? We focus upon the dua. We ask Allah to keep us happy and to strengthen our hearts and to give us that satisfaction just as the man who wakes up in the morning. Mu'afan fi jasadihi. 
You know, he's, he's, he, he's in good health in his body. And he has enough food till the evening. And it is as if the whole of the dunya has been gathered for him. My brothers and sisters, as occurs with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he would call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha wa zakkiha anta khayru man zakkaha anta waliyuha wa mawlaha. This supplication in itself and this is what will bring about happiness. The more that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, bring taqwa to my soul and purify it. For indeed you are the best of those who purifies the soul. You are the best and the most worthy of purifying it. For you are its guardian. And you are its helper and protector. Calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Purifying the soul. From seeking out that which is forbidden. Chasing that which is haram. Being patient with the trials that come upon you. Just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. Regarding the attitude of the believer. Returning back to that which we mentioned at the beginning. What should your attitude be? In times of ease, in times of calamity. What should your attitude be? The believer, his attitude is always having good thoughts for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ajaban li amri al-mu'min. Inna amrahu kullahu lahu khair. Wa laysa thalika li ahadin illa lil mu'min. In asabathu sarra'u shakar fakana khairan lahu. وَإِنْ أَسَابَتْهُ الدَّرَّاءُ سَبَرْ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ How wonderful the Prophet ﷺ said in this narration reported by Imam Muslim in his Sahih. How wonderful is the affair of the believer. All of his affairs are good. All of his affairs are good. And that does not apply to anyone except a believer. If something good happens to him, he shows gratitude. And that is good for him. He is grateful. He is shakir. And if something bad befalls him, he bears it with patience. And that is good for him. Every affair of the believer is good. That is not except for a mu'min. It's not for a kafir. Because the kafir sees the world falling around. Falling down upon him. From around him. Whereas the believer says, Alhamdulillah, I just have to be patient. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ O you who believe, seek the aid of Allah with patience and with the prayer. For indeed Allah is with the patient. So when calamities strike, the believer seeks help from Allah. He knows that this painful decree that has come down upon him, maybe he lost his job, Maybe he lost his mother, his father, his wife, his children. Maybe a calamity has struck so great upon him that he cannot walk. Maybe he's afflicted with an ailment or an illness or a sickness that may lead to his death. So what does he do? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sta'inu bi sabri wa salah. Oh you who believe, seek the help of Allah through patience and through the prayer. For indeed Allah is with the patient. فَذْكُرُونِ يَذْكُرْكُمْ وَشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ Still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands you. فَذْكُرُونِ Remember me. Glorify me. Praise me. Magnify me. Call upon me. أَذْكُرْكُمْ Then I shall remember you. Remember me and I shall remember you Allah says. وَشْكُرُوا لِي and be grateful to me. And do not deny my favors. Do not disbelieve in the favors that I have bestowed upon you. This is the way of the believers. Attitude. 
the way that you look at things, the way that you prioritize things. And this will eliminate worry, my brothers and sisters, from your lives. You will worry less. It doesn't mean that a believer does not become sad. The Prophet ﷺ cried at the death of his son. The eyes shed tears, he said. The eyes, they shed tears and the heart, it grieves. But we will not say except that which pleases our Lord. There will be times in our life when we will be sad. As for falling into the depths of depression, where we cannot lift ourselves out, then that is not the way of the believer because depression is indicative of despair. And the believer does not despair. Because he knows that this life is a life that will come to an end. It is fleeting. It is short. It is nothing compared to the life of the hereafter. So he doesn't give this life the importance that the kuffar they do because this dunya for the kafir is what is a jannah. Sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir as the Prophet Sallallahu said. This dunya is a prison for the believer so he knows that I am locked in. These calamities and these hardships will not cause me to disbelieve. It will not cause me to despair. I will be like the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was or at least as close as I can be as possible. I will not give importance to the fleeting pleasures of this world. Rather, I will look ahead. The Prophet Sallallahu said to one of the companions that your nafs has a right over you. Your nafs has a right over you. What is the right of that nafs? The right of that nafs is that you take that which it needs from the pleasures of the dunya, from your wives, from your children, but not that which will cause you to forget your Lord, such that you become inattentive and forgetful. So remember me and I shall remember you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. So yes, it is not that the Muslim does not like good food, that he does not desire to have something of wealth or children or steed or a riding beast or a nice home as the Prophet ﷺ said that there are four things that make a man happy a righteous wife he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said in a narration that the world is nothing but utilities and the best of the utilities of the world is to have a righteous wife. There are four things that bring contentment and happiness to a man. A righteous wife, a spacious home, a good neighbor. That's what the Prophet Sallallahu said. These are the things that give, that, that make a man happy. And they are things that make a man upset. That displease him. And they are the opposite of these. So there's no doubt, my brothers and sisters, that a Muslim pursues that which is in his benefit, but he prioritizes the affairs. He does not neglect the dunya. He does not, for example, pray the whole of the night and fast the whole of the day, every day. Why? Because now he has neglected the right of his wife because she has a right to him in the night. A person like the Prophet wasallam said that I have forbidden for you celibacy. So a Muslim must get married. We are not like the monks in the monasteries that we never marry. We take the position, as Sheikh Ibn Taymin and others have mentioned, that marriage is an obligation. Marry young. Sisters especially, marry young. You have a right to be selective. You are more selective than men because you have to be more careful. Because in the relationship, physically, the man is stronger. And he will provide for you. So you have to be careful that you choose the right partner, my sisters. And likewise, men, marry young. If you have something to give and something to support that woman, then marry. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, Ya Ma'ashir al-Shabaab, O gathering of youth, those of you who are able to marry, then let them marry. 
Because that will bring happiness that you have a partner. The Prophet ﷺ said in a narration that indeed marriage is half of your faith. Half of your iman is marriage. So fear Allah in the other half. Because that will bring you happiness. A happiness that is connected to your religion. The best dinar that you can spend, the Prophet ﷺ said, is the dinar that you spend upon your family. Meaning upon your wife and upon your children. And upon your parents, that's the best dinar. The best coin that can be spent is the one that you spent upon them. Meaning that you get a sense of satisfaction by the pleasure of others. That's not what you find in societies today. Everything is about me. What makes me happy? What gives me pleasure? What makes me joyous? What gives me a high? What stimulates me? Whereas really, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would give sadaqah, would give charity. And he would be happier giving in charity than the one who received charity. He would be more happy in giving than the one who received it from him. So this is a person taking joy and pleasure through the happiness of others. How do you inculcate that in your lives and in your souls and in your hearts? My brothers and sisters, it is through knowledge of Allah, knowledge of the religion, knowledge of the seerah, knowledge of the sunnah, knowledge of the salaf, knowledge of the sahaba radiallahu anhum. I have to stop there. I was trying to push it right till the end, but I don't think it's happening inshallah. I've got about a third of the way through, but inshallah, maybe on another occasion, bilillahi ta'ala. But nevertheless, I hope that these words, that they will benefit myself first and foremost, and likewise that it will benefit you and your families in prioritizing what is important in achieving happiness. How to bring about that true joy and pleasure and contentment of the soul. How that sometimes through the pleasure of others and showing and, and making others happy that you become happy. That we are people that share happiness. We don't confine it to ourselves. That we flee from vanity and arrogance and pride and jealousy and avarice. That we do not hate upon others whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon. Like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَا تَنْذُرُوا وَتَنْذُرُوا إِلَى مَنْ هُوَ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ Look at those who are lesser off than yourselves. And do not look at those who are better off than you. For indeed, that will save you from disparaging the goodness of the bounty that Allah has given you. So sometimes when you look at your situation, you look at the situation of others and you think to yourself, I'm a king compared to him. Allah has given me like he would give to a king compared to what he has given to Fulan. Allah has given me health that subhanallah, I should never be ungrateful for. I should rejoice in that which Allah has given him and make dua for those who are less off than me. That's why you should always look at those who are less off than yourselves. Let go of vanities. Let go of this mirror gazing. Every time you pass a mirror, you're looking into it. Because this is what they want for broadcast yourself. Display yourself. Wear your finery. And let the world see what you're wearing. This is nothing but vanity and showing off. Where's the humility and the humbleness? You know, when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud had climbed a tree in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he was trying to get from the tree the siwak to clean his teeth. So some of the companions saw him climbing up and they started laughing at his, at his legs that were skinny. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, what are you laughing at? By Allah, his legs in the sight of Allah are like Uhud. Those legs of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in the sight of Allah are like the Mount of Uhud. 
Because that is where Iman is. Iman is not what you display outwardly, meaning in the forms of your body. Of course, Iman is. And from the definition of Iman is your outward righteous deeds. But Iman is not measured by your forms as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Inna Allah la yanzuru ila suwarikum wa amwalikum. Allah does not look, indeed Allah does not look at your outward forms or at the amount of wealth that you possess. But rather Allah looks at your a'mal, at your qulub and your a'mal, at your hearts and your deeds. So get out of this you know, this vicious culture that we live in today, where people don't know whether they are male or female, man or woman. They don't know how to even identify their own jins, their own sex. You know, because of the confusion that is spread in societies around you, they, they think that the, whole, that, that the whole issue of happiness revolves around you. And how much you love yourself and how much you display yourself. And that's what social media is all about. You want happiness? Follow your religion. Develop good character. Act upon that which you know. Teach it to others. Share the happiness that you have with others. Gift others. Love others. Love your brother for Allah's sake. Like the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'ad, Ya Mu'ad, Wallahi, Inni lahubbuka. He said, Inni. He said, Indeed, I love you, Ya Mu'ad. By Allah, I love you. So the Prophet ﷺ loved Mu'ad ibn Jabal. So when you love your brother, say to him, I love you. Uhibbuka fi Allah. Ya Akhi Al-Kareem. Because now you're showing that actually Islam teaches us that we love others for the sake of Allah. Like the Prophet Wasallam said, the one who loves for Allah, hates for Allah, gives for Allah, takes for Allah, has perfected Iman. These are the things that bring about happiness. In the pleasure of our Lord, we find happiness. happiness. In the pleasure of our parents, we find happiness. When we're with our wives, we are happy. When we are with our brothers, we are happy. When we are with our sons and our daughters, we are happy. So get married. Build your families. Follow these traditional values of Islam. Leave this country. Go and live amongst the Muslims. Where you'll find further happiness. Because now you are amongst those people who share your values, share your heritage. Insha'Allah, look for Salafi communities overseas. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I am free from anyone who builds his home among the mushrikeen. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has freed himself. As Shaykh Al-Bani has authenticated this narration in Sahih Jami. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is bari'un from every Muslim who builds his home and he lives amongst the mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this earth vast. This is the striving that I'm talking about. Happiness will not come about except through struggle and striving. You want joy, you want serenity, you want comfort, you want contentment of the soul and the nafs in your life. Then strive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for his deen. Barakallahu feekum walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Questions? Okay, inshallah. Inshallah. Is watching anime Cartoons considered haram as they, as, as they contain. I've never actually seen one. So I assume the questioner is, is correct. He says as they, as they contain that which is shirk and reading minds and regeneration and so on. That I've read about. It is haram. 
It is a waste of time. Many of them are geared towards adults. Why is a grown man watching cartoons? You know, do something useful with your life. Spend some time with your wife. Play with her. Walk with her. Spend some time with your children. Educate them. Nurture them. Go and visit your parents. Go and visit your brother. Go and sit in a dars. Go and spend some more hours at work even. So that you can get some money together to perform umrah with your wife and your children. Or your parents. As for wasting your time with cartoons and frivolity and movies and seasons. The whole pull really. They're the intelligent ones. You're the stupid ones. The ones who watch this are the stupid ones. Because they're the ones who are making money out of you. When you register for these, for these seasons and serials and movies and you pay for the latest, you know, game on your Xbox or PlayStation or whatever else that is out there, they're the intelligent ones because they're the ones who are making money out of you. You don't get anything out of it except wasting of time. So you can say, oh, I'm, really, I'm a really good gamer. Let's see how that goes on your CV. And definitely that will not help you in your grave. The only thing you can bring is that you're really good at FIFA. Barakallahu feekum, don't waste your time. Don't waste your children's time. If you don't know how to entertain your children, if you don't know what is, you know, what is really good for the building of their souls and their character and their bodies and their minds, that which will make them grow and see the world. If you don't know, ask. Ask someone who lived in the real world. Do something useful with your children. Do something useful with your wives, with your brothers. Go camping, go walking. Go and see the world. Climb something. Run somewhere. Or do something in the deen that is even better for you. Go and perform hajj or umrah. Go and visit your brothers. If there's a conference somewhere in another country, save up and go to that conference and benefit. And your children will benefit. They'll benefit in a week more than they will benefit in six months at a state school. Because they're seeing, they're experiencing, they're feeling. They're educating themselves. They are seeing the real world. Not an, not an illusion. Keep away from this type of frivolity and entertainment and protect your children from it. If you don't know how, then talk to someone. If you're, if you're a young man sitting here today, oh no, what am I going to do when I go home? Dad's not going to let me play. Maybe that's good for you, young man. That now you have to think out of the box and think, well, my life doesn't revolve around the Xbox or the TV set. Or the 56 inch plasma. Or who man you are going to play next week. My life doesn't revolve around that. There are more important things in life. Than the late, latest Nike. Or the latest Adidas. Or the latest. There are more important things in life. And wallahi they are. But you don't know. Because you're living in a bubble. In a cocoon. You haven't seen the world. Go and travel. And see what Allah has, Allah has created in the world of mountains and valleys and trees and forests and woods and seas and oceans. Go and see what Allah has created. Go and see what the world has to offer. Experience. Go with your parents. Parents take your children. What is the ruling on saying Bismillah in the toilet if you need to make wudu? Then it is allowed. And that is the most correct opinion of the scholars. And Allah knows best. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say Bismillah before undressing to relieve himself. And that was in the vicinity. That was exactly where he was going to relieve himself. He would say Bismillah before uncovering himself to relieve himself. What is your advice with marrying a non-Salafi sister thinking that you can give a da'wah? Don't bother. Don't waste your time. That's... Look how many sisters there are looking to get married. And the only thing you want to marry is a non Salafi sister. If you want to marry her, tell her become Salafi. Actually, you don't tell her because I don't trust you. Connect her to, your, to another Salafi. A mature woman in the community who is a Salafi sister. 
so she can give a da'wah. If she becomes Salafi, marry her. Don't marry non-Salafis. Barakallahu feekum. Abdurrahman ibn Miljim made that mistake. And he ended up killing Ali. Radiallahu anhu. He said, I'll marry her and I'll bring her to the sunnah. He married her and she took him to the ways of the khawarij. And he, and he whilst he was with the khawarij, he was convinced by their ideology and he ended up killing Amir al-Mu'mineen, the fourth caliph, Ali radiallahu anhu. It doesn't work. Let them become Salafi and marry them. We have Salafi sisters who want to get married. You've just got to work at getting them. I don't mean you. I mean someone on your behalf, your mother. Or your father speaks to her father. Or someone from, a, from someone who is a female can speak to her on your behalf. There are sisters out there amongst our Salafi community who are just waiting to get married. But they're looking for good men who are strong, brave, courageous, Salafi, even though that should come first. Honest, truthful, hardworking. Doesn't mean rich, hardworking. Because your risk is written for you, but you work hard. Marry those women. Even if my, and my sisters, those of you who are in your 30s, and you haven't found a partner yet, you haven't found a husband, or that you are divorced, or that your husbands have passed away, then be a second wife to someone. But be a second wife to a man who can look after you. He can provide you. Not that he puts you on the DSS. So now he gets double housing benefits. Don't marry men like this. Don't marry men that are going to make you go and beg to the government. A man who can provide for you. That shows you the importance of working, my brothers. If you want another wife and a third wife and a fourth wife, then make sure that you can provide for them. Make sure that you can provide for them. Don't send them out to work. Don't marry a man on the basis, well, I'll marry you if you go out and work and provide for yourself. Don't marry like this, my sisters. You want a man who is honest, truthful, strong, able to provide for you, able to provide for his first, first wife and able to provide for extra wives. But if you are young, if you are young, my sisters, then marry. Ask your guardians, your elder brother, your father, help me to get married. Don't be shy. Like Umm Sulaim said to the Prophet wasallam, that indeed Allah is not shy of the truth. So don't be shy and ask. Because if you don't ask, you don't get. There's a car that's blocking, so the brother's going to make an announcement, inshallah. Vehicle registration number LS540EL, Honda LS540EL. Please return to your car immediately. Question, can I pray Isha? From 12 midnight through to Fajr, or is there, is there a time when Isha ends? Then the most correct opinion of Ahlul Ilm, and time does not go into uh, in, uh, does, time does not allow us for, to go into the details of the fiqh. But the most correct position of Ahlul Ilm is that Isha extends up until midnight, half the night. Beyond that, then the scholars then they differ. A group say that after midnight it becomes mukruh in the third part of the night it becomes even more disliked so therefore you should always try to pray Isha late but before the middle of the night and ideally in Jama'ah if you can hear the Adhan and even if you can't hear the Adhan then still try to make it to the Masjid so the most correct position is because of the Hadith of Jibreel when he came to the Prophet Sallallahu he came to him one day at the beginning of the times and the next day at the end of the times so he came on the second night for Isha, midnight, at the middle of the night. Barakallahu feekum. So it is not 12 a.m. Because 12 a.m. does not signify in every case that it is the middle of the night. Middle of the night is between the start of Maghrib and the start of the true dawn. 
So between Maghrib, start of Maghrib and the start of the, of the true dawn, you will have hours. Then you slice those hours in half. And the middle of the night is in the middle of that. After that, you are still obligated to pray, but then it becomes disliked. And some say that if you leave it till the last third of the night, then it becomes even more disliked. Can I work for a finance company as a sales broker? No, you cannot. Finance companies deal in riba. So you cannot work for a finance company, not even cleaning their windows, not vacuuming their floors, not cleaning their bathrooms, nothing. Finance companies such as banks and financial institutions in this country, every single one of them deals in riba. So you are not allowed to work for them or with them or to cooperate with them. وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and do not cooperate with each other upon sin and transgression. And same applies for any institution where the majority of its earnings or the vast majority of its earnings are haram, such as banks, pubs, nightclubs, pork farms, any institution or company that deals in that which is predominantly and mostly haram, Overwhelmingly haram, it is not permissible to work for them, doing anything for them. What do you do with money from something haram after you found it was haram? If you mean by this that you made money which was from haram earnings, such as the selling of drugs or the selling of wine or the selling of mortgages then whatever you made from that then you cannot live on it nor can you feed your family upon it you give it away in sadaqa and whomsoever you give it to such as a masjid or a markaz then you inform them that this money was from haram earnings so they may dispose of it in a manner that is lowly such as a masjid that wishes to rebuild or expand its toilet facilities, or that they want to build a path that leads to the masjid that is trod upon, so it is made lowly. And this is the fatwa of Imam Ahmed and others. Is plucking your beard by hand a major sin? If you mean plucking the whole of him, it's a painful way of removing a beard. But if you mean plucking the whole of it or shaving the whole of it, then that is a major sin. Even to trim the beard, to cut the beard beyond the grip of four fingers or the, or the fistful. So if you are looking at me now, then you will see that I've taken my beard beneath my chin in my fist. Whatever remains beyond that, then a group of the Sahaba, such as Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Umar, and other than them, that they would take from that which remains beyond the fistful. So therefore that becomes a sunnah of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that many of the scholars such as Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullahu ta'ala ascribe that to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for trimming beyond that, then that is haram. As for the opinions of the scholars, then the opinions of the scholars have no value. As much as we respect them and honor them as it, as it relates to the hadith and the command of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As for shaving the beard, then that is an even greater sin than trimming it. That is an even greater sin than trimming it. For the Prophet ﷺ commanded us to grow the beard and to trim the mustache. The Prophet ﷺ commanded the Sahaba عنهم, to differ from the Jews and the Christians and the Magians by growing the beard and trimming the mustache. So the Prophet ﷺ definitely did not cut his beard. And if he did cut, then it was not beyond the fistful. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum did not cut their beards. And if they did, it was never beyond the fistful. And anyone who claims other than that, then that is his ra'i, that is his opinion. And the opinions of men are not a proof when it comes to the hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The only person from amongst Mankind that is followed unconditionally without question is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ عَمْرِهِ 
because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, let those beware who oppose the command of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa So what did the Messenger command with? He commanded you to grow the beard. Differ from the Jews, differ from the Christians, differ from the Magians, do not shave your beards, differ from the non-Muslims in general, in your attire, in your garments, in your fashions. Our fashions and our trends and our heritage must be in accordance to the heritage of Islam, the Sahaba, and especially if it agrees with the command of Allah's Messenger then no one's command and no one's opinion. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, Sheikh Fulan said. This is the way of Bin Baz and Al-Albani and Muqbil. This is the way of Ahlul Hadith of the Salaf and later times. How dare anyone come along and say the opinion of any man is relevant when he opposes the command of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So there's an article on the growing of the beard and likewise hairstyles. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbade the kaza and the hadith are too numerous to mention. Forbade it. Either keep all of it or remove all of it. He forbade the shaving of the part of the, part of the head and leaving a hair on the other part of the head. It doesn't matter the ra'i of fulan and fulan, even if he be from the great scholars. It doesn't matter. There is no great scholar alive today greater than Abu Bakr and Umar. And this is what we find from the statement of Sheikh Al-Fawzan and Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz and Sheikh Al-Albani and Sheikh Rabi' and Sheikh Muqbil and Sheikh Ahmed Al-Najmi and Al-Luhidan and others. This, this is the way of the scholars of our times. That the speech of no man is given precedence over the speech of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he forbade the qaza. He forbade the shaving of the sides of the heads. For that is the imitation of the kuffar. And it is an imitation of the Jews. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he forbade imitating the unbelievers for whomsoever resembles the people, as he said in the narration in Musnad of Imam Ahmed, Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. And whomsoever resembles the people is from them. So if the kuffar bring in a fashion of shaving the side of the head, then we do not shave the side of the head and say that it is mubah. Or that we say it is only makruh because fulan and fulan said, that it is makruh. What did Rasulullah say? Alayhi salatu wasalam, don't get your children into the habit of imitating the kuffar and disregarding the hadith of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam and regard them to be just mere statements of the Prophet that the opinions of others can override. No, no speech of, no, of any person can override what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said. And likewise with the ismal. The Prophet Sallallahu commanded with the raising of the garments above the ankles. And whatever falls below the ankles, then it is in the fire. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered us to follow his sunnah. And this was the statement of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu to Urwa ibn Zubair, who was a son of one of the Sahaba, Zubair ibn al-Awwam, who was one of the ones who was promised Jannah. So Urwa said to Ibn Abbas, I have heard that you allow people and that you are telling the people to make Umrah in the first 10 days or in the first 8 days of Dhul Hijjah. He said, yes I do. Because that is the sunnah of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu for Hajj. Hajj al Making Umrah and then coming out of Ihram and then re-entering into Ihram on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. He said, why are you telling the people this? This is wrong. You are misguiding them. He said, go and ask your mother. He said, Abu Bakr and Umar didn't do what you're doing, Ya, ya, ya Abdullah ibn Abbas. So Abdullah ibn Abbas said, this is what will destroy you. And this is what will bring the punishment of Allah upon you. That I say to you that Allah's messenger said, and you bring to me Abu Bakr and Umar. And that narration is sahih. As Sheikh Muqbil and others have said, that narration is sahih. So who is there greater than Abu Bakr and Umar? 
that Abdullah ibn Abbas said, I bring to you the words of Rasulullah. And you say to me, but, and you bring to me Abu Bakr and Umar. I bring to you the words of Rasulullah and you bring to me an Nawawi and Ibn Hajar. I bring to you the Salaf and what they did amongst the Sahaba. And you bring to me a Faqih from the Middle Ages or a scholar of today. This is what Shaykh Al Albani refuted. This is what Muqbil refuted. This is what Ibn Baz refuted. This is what Rabi refutes. This is what Fawzan refutes. Don't fall into this. This is not the manhaj of Ahlul Hadith. The methodology and the madhab of Ahlul Hadith is the hadith of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you have something to, from Rasulullah that is to the country of that and it is authentic upon him, then bring it. Otherwise, we say what Abdullah ibn Abbas said. That I fear that stones will rain down from the sky upon your head. That I say to you, Qala Rasulullah, and you say to me, Qala Abu Bakr wa Umar. The skin trembles if a person was to say today, Abu Bakr and Umar said, and you reject it. We would rightfully feel we have to be careful because this is Abu Bakr and Umar. But in consideration of the hadith of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then with all the respect and honor and love and mahabba that we have for Abu Bakr and Umar, the words of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are wahi. They are revelation from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala wa ma yantiqu anil hawa. And he never spoke from his desires. So have this in mind. When you see this, this trend towards ease and fashion and following the unbelievers or following trends that you find a hadith and then you start thinking to yourself well maybe it's just makru maybe it's not really a command because fulan and fulan said look at the words of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam because that is revelation that's what the sahaba were upon that was their way ubada ibn samit when muawiya radiyallahu anhu said some words and he said that I don't see what, when he quoted the hadith of riba. He said, no, it is not riba. He said, I say to you what Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, and you bring me your opinion, by Allah, I will not live in a land where you are in charge of me. That's what one companion said to another companion. And he went to Medina, where Umar ibn al-Khattab was the Khalifa, where he was the Amir al mumineen And he said, what happened? He said, this is what happened. He said, go back, I will write for you. How deprived a country is, or a land is that where you are not present. So he wrote to Muawiyah and he said, he is right, you are wrong. You have no authority over him. This is Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Are we allowed to wait outside the masjid for a khutbah of, non -Salafi, of a non-Salafi masjid and Jummah? Don't set bad examples, my brothers. First of all, look for a Salafi masjid. If you don't live next to a Salafi masjid, go and live near a Salafi masjid. You say it's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. But you have to take measure. If you cannot move from one part of, another, one part of a city to another part of the city, how are you going to change countries? How are you going to change countries? If you can't take those measures, okay, if you're a youth, 16, 17, you're living with mom and dad, and mom and dad don't want to move. But you're a married man with children. I understand in certain situations it's hard. But strive, go and live in a Salafi community. How long do you think you can survive outside of a Salafi community? Have, look what you've got in London. I assume the question is in London, inshallah, because we're sitting in London. So we have in London, Masjid Sunnah, Cranford. Masjid Darul Sunnah, Wembley, Shepherd's Bush. Al, uh, Markaz al Sunnah Alperton, Mushad bin Baz, East London, Markaz Mu'ad bin Jabal, Slough. All of them, have I missed anyone? All of them is in the radar. Five, right? Move to one of them. Move to the community that is near to one of them. Yes, your work might be further, but your deen is closer. Where would you rather be? 
Closer to your deen or closer to your work? Closer to your deen. Imagine if you live somewhere around here. How many durus you can attend with your wife and children? But if you're going to have to catch two tubes to get here, how invigorated or how you know, eager are you going to be to catch two tubes with your wife and kids? But if you're a stone throw away, five minutes away, ten minute walk away from Markaz al-Sunnah in Alperton, or Markaz Daru sunnah in Shepherd's Bush, or Masjid al-Sunnah in Cromford, or Masjid bin Baz in East London, if you're a stone throw away, ten minute walk, let's say, you're going to go to the Darus, you're going to go to the Juma, uh, to the to the khutbahs or the khutbah on Yom al -Jum ah. So move. If you are forced to pray behind Ahlul Bid'ah by necessity, I'll tell you what I do or what I've done. Just delay your arrival out of fear of allowing your ears to listen to that which is hated by Allah and his bid'ah. Delay your arrival. So make sure that you catch the prayer, but you delay your arrival. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that word is a masjid of sunnah, that you'd be the first or you'd be amongst the earliest ones in the masjid. <laughs> that indeed actions are but by intentions. I don't say that as an absolute rule for you, but to protect your ears from the khutb so that you don't have to ring one of us and say, you know what, Ustad, I heard you know, khutbah that they were saying such and such. Is it true? So you don't have to ask those silly questions because you, you weren't there to hear it. Inshallah. Last question. What do you say about a caller to Islam who gives himself the title Da'wa Man? Who with his companions started a club called the Badr Club where they accept only 313 people. The amount of people who died at the Battle of Badr. And the time spent in it is 313 hours and the price is 313 pounds for participants. And those who get in, seven lectures each is called, for every seven lectures it is called a military operation or expedition. All this is supposedly to lead Muslims to be of high value. Ah, to be a high value man. You really want me to answer this, Ya Ikhwan? I mean, you don't know? This is nothing but bid'ah, foolishness, ignorance, using the religion to gain the dunya to increase themselves in the possessions of the dunya using sloganism and events of, of a serious nature where the amount of people who died at Badr was not 313 by the way but anyway that's what it says and I only read the question as it was nevertheless the point here being that all of this is misguidance and it is, it is used as a tool as a branding tool or a marketing tool to convince the Muslims to give them money and to follow their sect and to follow their groups and to follow their parties. These people are ignoramuses who are young. They use the strength of social media to misguide the people. But as I said when I was speaking about gaming, the real foolish ones are the ones who are giving them money. Because in days gone by, the people of misguidance used to work hard to misguide the people. And it used to be free. Nowadays, they're misguiding you and you're paying for the privilege of being misguided. So you're paying for it as well. You know, it's like you're paying for your own destruction. 
you're paying for a path that leads to hellfire. Just as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, هَذِهِ سُبُلٌ مُتَفَرِّقَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ سَبِيلٍ شَيْطَانٍ يَدْعُوا إِلَيْهِ Next to the straight path, had the Sabilullah, when you drew that path, you drew the other paths. And he said, these are divergent paths. At the head of each one, each of them is a devil calling to it. So these are devils that are calling to their paths of misguidance. These are callers to misguidance and callers to the dunya. Callers who are calling you to let go of your money, to release your funds so they can misguide you. So you feel satisfied that you spent good money to be misguided. And these are just slogans. How dare they use a tremendous event of the Badr, of the Battle of Badr, in the time of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was the first of the major campaigns of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where the majority of those who participated were the Muhajirun, those who were exiled, and those who migrated to Medina and they fought at that battle and some of them were martyred. How dare they use those figures and those numbers as a marketing tool to fill their bank accounts. Avoid these types of people and anyone similar to them. These people are his beyond, Ahlul Bid'ah, misguided, calling others to misguidance. Du'at ala abwabi jahannam as the Prophet sallallahu said. Callers upon the gates of the hellfire. Sif hum lana ya Rasulullah. Describe them to us, O Messenger of Allah. Hum min jildatina. They are from us, meaning from the Muslims. From our skin, meaning from our people. Wa yatakallamuna bi alsinatina. And they speak with our tongue. So they speak with the language of Islam. And they are from the ranks of the Muslims, but they are du'at who stand at the gates of Jahannam. And there are many of them. And the majority of the callers are from this sinf, are from this group, or from these types of groups. The people who are upon the straight path, then they are few in every generation. Yes, they are now, alhamdulillah, after the grace and the mercy of Allah upon us and His bounty, after 30 years of da'wah, that they are many thousands of Salafis in the UK who are staunchly upon Salafiya and Sunnah. I can't put a figure on it. But if you count the various Eids that take place, because you can't be in two Eids at the same time, right? Regardless of what these cyber fanatics think, all right? So sometimes what we do is that just to get an idea of the amount of people that are attracted towards the Da'wah, that we do a count. So when Markaz Sunnah here in Alperton does its Eid Khutbah or the Eid prayer, we find out generally how many people attended. Daru Sunnah, how many people attended? Masjid bin Baz, how many people attended? Markaz Mu'ad, how many people attended? Uh, uh, Masjid Sunnah in Cranford, how many people attended? Likewise in Slough, in Cardiff, in Bristol, in Birmingham, in Stoke, in Manchester, in Bradford, in Middlesbrough. In all of these places where the Salafis have centers of learning, that how many gather for Eid? And when you add the figures together, it is somewhere in the region of 20,000 in total. And maybe there's more than that, that they end up at the local masjid with their parents and so on. But it gives you a ballpark. We can't be exact, but it gives you a ballpark. Salafia is growing, but it is still a minority. As a, as a, you know, as a jama'ah, then it is a minority of the Muslims as a whole because there are over 1.5 million Muslims in the UK. So even if there was 20 or 30,000 Salafis, it's a small minority. But amongst the practicing Muslims, those who consider themselves to be practiced, then it is practicing, then it's a sizable number. If you consider that the Salafis have been giving da'wah actively, really for only for the last 25 years, let's say, whereas some of these other jama'at have been here since the 60s. You know, they've been here for 30 years before the Salafis really became active. Not that Salafis weren't here before, because they were, but they were in small pockets and they were, you know, not very active. So our da'wah is growing. So we are not in need. We have the roots everywhere. 
Why do you need to be one of 313 and pay 313 and then regret paying 313 when you can come to Markaz al Sunnah and get it free and get it authentic? Go to Salah, Markaz Mu'ad and get it free and get it authentic. Go to Markaz al Salafi in Manchester, get it free and in Liverpool. With those brothers at Markaz al Bukhari, get it free and authentic. And elsewhere around the country, Salafis have centers of learning all around the country. Students of knowledge who teach. Oxford. Walillah alhamd. Salafis in Oxford. Salafis in Reading. Markaz al Salafi in Reading. Milton Keynes. I don't want someone saying afterwards, oh, you didn't mention us. So I'm trying to just get everything in. All of these centers of learning and studying and marakis up and down the country, move to one of them. You shouldn't be listen, you know, living isolated, you know, in Portsmouth or in Cornwall somewhere. You know, go to where the Salafis are. Choose where you want and then plan towards it. And then the next stage is to go to a Muslim country. Heritage country is ideal for you. Because in a heritage country of yours, you can live freely. Without an iqama that is renewed every year, you can live freely, openly, own property, build houses. And it is yours generationally. Generation after generation, it is yours. We've just come back from Pakistan, myself, Abu Iyad. Abu Hakim, after a few weeks of da'wah. And we see that the da'wah in those countries in Pakistan is growing. As it is, I spoke to a brother yesterday who just came back from Somalia three days ago. He said it's, it's amazing in Haragesa. Amazing. The aman, the peace. He said, yes, it is developing. You know, it's not that it is wealthy and rich, but it is rich in terms of heritage. And the fact that Everywhere around you are Muslims. And likewise in other countries such as Morocco with our brother Abdul Ilah Lahmami. In these places you find that now Marakis are being built. Like in Islamabad, Markaz al-Darimi and Masjid al-Darimi. Publications, I think they've just published about 12, 13 books in Urdu of high quality that I've never seen in the Urdu language before. In that quality and in that subject matter conference that we organized in Islamabad I think about two weeks ago with our brother Abu Hakim and others and there are students of knowledge there Abu Arwa, Ali, Mir who moved from the UK to Pakistan and likewise Zubair, Abbasi and Tariq Ali Brohi in one place three students of knowledge teaching Arabic and teaching Quran and there's a sister there that teaches Quran three times a week at their markas and then they're building a masjid a sizable masjid. This can actually replicate itself in other countries, but we have to be there. You can't do it remotely. You can't sit here and expect four walls to put themselves up, you know, in uh, Somalia or Morocco or elsewhere. So let's do what we can do. Optimistic, zeal. You yourselves may not be individually capable because you may not have the means or the know-how. But there will be others who are already working. So you aid them, you support them, you visit with them. Or you go to the place that they visited and you see, okay, I'm from Pakistan. A person may say, I'm from Pakistan, I've never seen Pakistan. But Abu Hakim has already been and gone. You know, that is a bit ajeeb. A man from Jamaican heritage travels all the way to Pakistan, lands in Lahore, travels to Talagang in Punjab. Then he moves further north towards Islamabad and, and stays in Rawalpindi. And you say to yourself, I've never even heard of these names and, I'm, and my mom and dad are from Pakistan. Why does he do that, Ya Ikhwan? Because of his love. Because of his love for Sunnah and the Salafis. So where are you with that? Ask yourselves the question, my brothers and sisters, Barakallahu Feekum. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to that which is best and protect us from all that which is evil, and guide us to the straight path and enter as united in Al Firdausul A'la. Wa jazakumullahu khairan. Wa subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.
I think Abu Idris is next in about after the prayer I would have thought inshallah barakallahu feekum